record? Are we recording it? And it looks like we are recording right now. Welcome yeah, to our, our conversation of the Dave and Ed podcast with Peter Maloney. The legend, the icon, the hero. Better well, New York actor. Well, Peter, we've spent a lot of the last two episodes talking about your film and TV life. So we thought we could talk a little bit about your theater and your writing and your directing, yes. et cetera, today. All right. Talk to us about the theater. Maybe we could, <laughs> could we, do you want to work, do you want to be non-linear and begin with your drama desk award-winning performance in Outside Mullingar? Well, that was an interesting uh, experience. I had three, I had about an hour and a half uh, rehearsal. Right. Uh, really? I, I took over for uh, someone. Okay. And um, they called me in at the last minute. So I only had a, a, about three days of work on it and had to learn it. And I didn't learn it. I couldn't learn it that fast. So they had a, a woman in the front row with a text. Uh, and when I, needed, <clears throat> when I needed to be prompted, I just looked at her and said, yes. Right. Nice. And uh, she threw me the line, you know. But I got the lines down pretty quick. Okay. Uh, it, it was a, a great experience. I, I I just loved it. I mean, it was it was wonderful. That's Shanley, you know. So yeah, who who we, who we spoke to in uh, our Dave and Ed podcast. Yeah, Shanley's a great friend of the Dave and Ed podcast. He speaks highly of you. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, and the the main thing for me was, you know, uh, I, I might have mentioned before in one of these episodes that. As my father always told me, you know, it's not just all about you. It's who you're working with. Yes, right. And uh, ever since I saw uh, uh, Beauty Queen, the plays of Martin McDonough, and especially The Lonesome West. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, I wanted to work with Brian. Oh uh, yes. And I used to uh, hang around, you know, the Actors Studio and uh, the, the uh, Edison Hotel, and and Edison. Uh, Brian and Martin would often have a breakfast there, you know, and I would sometimes stop by and and say hello, and I just it just to be in Brian's company yeah. was wonderful, but to act with him, that was the thrill. You see, a good that, actor. Yes. Oh, you rate him. Absolute. Right. Fucking brilliant. I mean, right. and and. Uh, <clears throat> so that was that was a great experience there. Great. Plus, anytime I'm working on Broadway, I appreciate you know I appreciate it. Yeah. What do you think about awards and stuff like that? Well, you know, I've I've never uh, I, I I used to get them in college because you know I was ubiquitous. I was you couldn't uh, <laughs> uh, once the curtain opens, there I'd be. It seemed that way, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I started getting awards in college, and then, as I say, I came to New York, and there was nothing. I got nothing for the next, uh, you know, forty years. Mm -hmm. uh, the past few years, I've gotten some awards. I'm always happy when someone appreciates my work, sure. but I'm past the award <laughs> excitement. You know, sure. Yeah, I get uh, these these kinds of awards, which I don't even know who's given them. You know, just that they thought I did a good job. And right, so, right. Uh, you know, something will come my way. I don't think too much about them. <clears throat> and I don't uh, watch the award shows very often. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. um, you, you've done over 25 plays at the Atlantic Theatre Company. Oh, yeah. Talk to, talk to us about working for them. 25. Um, one of the things I wanted to say in this, in this episode is, oh, yeah. um, you know, Any time a play is done, uh, a family is created. Yes. Now, it might be a friendly family. It might be a not-so-friendly family. Right, right. But it is a family. And I think part of the reason that we do this <laughs> theater is that we're looking for that family. Yeah. The nice thing about being in a family at the theater is it's going to be over in about six to eight weeks. And you don't have to live with these people forever. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, and so it, it, it means a lot to me to be part of a company. Um, and it sustained me to be part of these companies. I've been a, a member for, uh, you know, 30 years of the Actors Studio, mm. uh, uh, the Atlantic, 
the I was seven years with the new dramatists. Uh, yeah. The Irish rep. Yeah. Um, I had a period of time for about five years where I worked very intently at the uh, HB Playwrights Foundation on Bank Street um, with Herbert Berghoff. Uh, and that's where I developed a, a kind of ability to, crit to be a critic and um, uh, an, uh, an editor and a, a moderator of um, playwrights, which I still do today at the Actors Studio. I don't do it at the HB Playwrights Foundation anymore. Herbert and I had a huge fight never made up and then he died right well, what was the fight about what 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 were you fighting what about? were you fighting about i'd rather not say okay okay i just had to ask the tabloid question peter yeah yeah it is it, it is our rupert murdoch i'm the so, rupert murdoch yeah. Yeah, give yeah, us yeah. <laughs> anyway we had a fight you know sort of inevitable was it physical did you punch him oh no i never punched him i would have laid him out you know that would not have been nice you know but um uh, really, uh, it ended badly, but it was a great five years. And of course, he was married to Uta Hagen, and, and she was my acting teacher for four years. Oh, yes. So I spent a, a fair amount of time at the HB uh, School mm -hmm. and at the HB Playwrights Foundation. Um, but uh, my time there was very valuable, you know, and what these teach. I guess I'm always looking for a teacher, you know, I'm always. Uh, I often ask actors in, in auditions, who do you study with? Interesting. You know, and if I find out they haven't studied with anybody, I'm, I'm sort of alar a bit alarmed and a little bit worried because I, I believe that you can't really um, succeed in a run in a play. You might be brilliant in the audition. I've been fooled a few times. You might be brilliant in the audition, but how are you gonna do on the stage in front of an audience for a period of time, every night, eight times a week, you know. Right. Uh, this depends. This means you you better have some technique. Yeah. yeah. Not just brilliance. Not just um, uh, inspiration that comes to you, but but uh, the ability to repeat the performance right. despite what you're feeling. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you do it? So, I, but I'm always looking for teachers. I told you I was an apple polisher. I have to watch that. You know. Right. Um, yeah, I, 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 I knew Leah Kazan, the great director, one of the greatest directors America has ever produced. And um, uh, he was, he hated apple polishers. Yeah. He hated good students. Right. And I love this man, you know, I, I love this Kazan. And um, I had to be careful because I saw myself slipping into the same old habits, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, kind of hero worship or the need for a father figure can be very dangerous for a guy like me okay. uh, who's always looking for somebody like my father who was a very strong uh, uh, persona in my life as I told you yeah. and so but Kazan couldn't stand it if you if you uh, behaved like a good student he didn't like it at all mm -hmm. you know he okay. wanted you to be your own man and he wanted you to be rebellious and and you know, don't 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 polish the apple for me. That was his point of view. So, uh, at the actor studio where I've been for about thirty years, um, I've worked with such wonderful, brilliant minds. You know, in the first uh, playwrights directors unit that I was a member of, you know, it was run by Arthur Penn, yes, Leah Kazan, right. and the great film director Joseph Mankiewicz. Yes. So these three guys were there every week running this gathering of playwrights. Oh, wow. And in the, in the group were, were Norman Mailer and Romulus Linney and um, wonderful, wonderful writers. Right, yes. So I had a lot of inspiration from these companies. And what I mainly got from the companies was a kind of continuity. Um, you know... Um, the fact that they were always there, even if I wasn't working in the show, which I often am not, you know, uh, I would go to the opening, I'd go out drinking after the opening night performance, I'd be around the actors. There's a wonderful feeling of, of camaraderie at the at these theaters. Now, these are not-for-profit theaters, usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And my theory about not-for-profit uh, theaters is that uh, if you aren't making any money, you better have a good time. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Yes. Right? So yeah. 
I usually have a good time at these not-for-profit theaters, and and they are, they they do beautiful work. The Atlantic's productions are so superb mm -hmm. in terms of production values. You know, it's just as as good as anything you'll see on Broadway. Um, I love working for Kieran and uh, Charlotte at the Irish Rep. I mentioned that I admired uh, her theater. Well, that theater is practically built by hand, and and it's one of the most gorgeous little theaters in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they're wonderful, wonderful places to be and to be working. And it makes the fact that you aren't getting paid much that much easier to take because they treat you well. Right. Certainly the less money you're getting paid, the better I want to be treated. Sure. Yeah. And if I'm not getting much money and I'm treated badly, I'm a really irritated person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, talk to us about being part of the Atlantic Ensemble. Yeah. Well, the Atlantic, you know, I turned them down. They asked me to become a member and they're very, uh, very um, selective in their members only, you know, Ensemble Studio Theatre, where I'm also a member, they have about five or 600 members. Yes. And um, the Atlantic's got about 40 members. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, they're much more uh, reluctant to take people in. Mm -hmm. uh, it usually means, it doesn't really mean, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to get parts mm -hmm. just because right. you're a member. Um, but um, they asked me to be a member and I, I was a member of so many of these groups that I said, you know, I, I can't, uh, I can't do another one. I, I, it wouldn't be fair to what I'm, the other groups I'm part of, and it wouldn't be fair to them, you know, as on the board of directors of this and that, and on this committee and that committee with one theater or another. So I said no to the first invitation, which I think shocked the hell out of them. <laughs> when, I, when I personally rejected them, and uh, uh, I found this out later, it never occurred to me that they would be uh, upset. But uh, I found this out later, and then it took a few years before they finally came back to me again. And, and of course, by that time, I was so in love with everybody there that I, I joined up immediately. Um, I've done so many interesting, wonderful plays there, you know, plays by John Guare and uh, uh, Harold Pinter. Um, I did Chekhov there. Um, Lately, uh, the last play I did was by the great British writer Simon Stevens, and uh, boy, that was really great to do. You know, I played the patriarch of a of a Manchester, England uh, family, mm -hmm. the grandfather. You know, who had a problem with the drink, and um, who also, you know, beat his wife up. You know, so it was yeah. less than sympathetic character, which I always enjoy playing. I like to play. I like to play bad guys, you know, I like to play I like a killer, killer, uh, yeah. you know, a, a real pervert. I like to play a real pervert yeah. Did who's you also a killer. So whatever he, bad things he does to the person, who, you know, he ends up killing them. Why wouldn't <laughs> you? Why, after yeah. you do all these terrible you things to the person, why wouldn't you kill him? <laughs> yes. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So I love playing a bad guy. I love playing a sicko. You know, uh, I love playing a sicko. Do you and, incorporate uh, your actor's studio training when you're playing these characters? What? Do you use method acting as a way in? To well, play? you know, um, yeah. Right. You know, what is the method but uh, Lee Strasberg's method uh, uh, of acting, which is based on and inspired by the great revolutionary teachings of Constantine Stanislavski the in the, uh, at the turn of the century, into, going into the 20th century. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I am a, a student of Uta Hagen, who is also uh, a, um, one of the inheritors of Stanislavski's legacy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, it's, um, it's a, it, what it is, it's a way of, of creating a character it's really not as mysterious as people often think it is. It's a very misunderstood uh, uh, method. Uh, in, you know, it's sort of easy to make fun of. 
sure. and uh, parody. Right. Um, sure. I think I did my share of that making fun of back in college before I knew anything about it. It didn't matter to me. I didn't need to know anything about something that I was making fun of, you know. <laughs> yeah. Very good. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, I always use uh, the, the, the method, and, uh, but it's my own method right. based on um, principles mm -hmm. created by bigger men than myself, you know? Right. And you, you take what will help you. You know, some of the greatest actors in the world have never uh, been inside the actor's studio. And some of the greatest actors in the world uh, were nurtured there and right. came out of there and are still there. Yeah, sure. So, um, there are no rules about it, you yeah. know. Um, so certainly, it served me. It served me well um, yeah. o o over all the years. Yeah. Can you talk about um, audiences in the smaller off-Broadway theaters as opposed to audiences on Broadway? Can yeah. You well. Yeah. You know, I got. I, I played a very funny part in John's play in uh, the uh, outside Mullingar. Yeah. So, Right. It's a heartbreaking role because I get to die on stage, and and when when I die, uh, or as I take my last breaths, believe me, there was hardly a dry eye in the house. Yeah, yeah. But before that, there were a lot of laughs, which I didn't really expect. I knew the guy; it was funny, but I didn't realize how funny. And I had just gotten my hearing aids, my first hearing aids, which I I have in right now. Mm -hmm. And um, so I go on stage, my first performance in this play, and I'm, I'm nervous as hell because I've only had a few days rehearsal. Um, and uh, Doug Hughes, you know, he, he, he worked with me very well to prepare me for this, but he didn't have a lot of time to do it. He was very stern and very insistent that I be letter perfect in the lines. And it took me a while to become letter perfect yeah. in the lines. But the humor was still there. And when I said the first lines that were meant to be funny, the audience exploded. And I wasn't used to it because I had been going deaf for some years and suddenly I had hearing aids in. Oh, okay. So the audience exploded with laughter and I kind of went, what the hell was that? Right, wow. right, yeah. You know? The problem with hearing aids is that it makes your fellow actors' uh, voices too loud in your ears. Right. And the other thing that's a problem with hearing aids is that at a certain point when the batteries run down, you're in the middle of a scene, a serious scene with somebody, and you hear a voice in your head that says, battery. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. And you, wow. don't know, you don't know where it's coming from. Uh, and you sort of like turn around and say, what the? Who the what? Yes. You know? And, uh, uh, it was so upsetting to me that I, I, when somebody else was talking, I took the hearing aids out and I put them in the pocket of my sweater. And, uh, but um, it was, uh, it was, um, it was good to get those laughs. I'll tell you, it was good. But you asked me about the smaller theaters. Well, the problem with a the smaller theater is, for example, the Atlantic. Um, I'm playing a scene with uh, Crystal Dickinson, who was uh, in this play by Lucy Thurber, called Bottom of the World. Mm -hmm. And Crystal and I are seated in chairs at the edge of the stage, the fore edge of the stage. I can reach out with my hand or my foot, and I can touch the person who's sitting in the front row. Right. That's how close. <coughs> Crystal and I had a scene which was extremely emotional. We just sat in our chairs. But as we did the scene, we wept, both of us. Right. And it was a beautiful scene. And when I'm doing the scene, I am aware that at least four people in the front row are sound asleep. <laughs> yeah. Several of them are, are snoring. <laughs> Old people like myself. Uh, I don't uh, snore. In, 
I try not to, I don't like to sit in the front row because I don't want to, if the actors see me there and they know me, it might throw them off. Right. But, uh, I don't snore, uh, but what I do, if I'm not happy with what I'm seeing, I sort of lean forward and I rock back and forth like this and I moan. I moan. Yeah. And my wife sitting next to me grabs me by the shirt and she pulls me back and she says, stop moaning. Because I find the what's going on. I find what's going on so bad. That one. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's terrible. Now, there are times I've had, I've only, really, it's funny that I've only walked out of a show once. I'm not even going to tell you the name of the show, but I walked out of a Broadway show once before the curtain call because I couldn't stand to face the actors, half of whom I knew. And, um, I, I didn't want anybody to see me that I was there, you know. So I ran away from the from the theater. I left the person who who had brought me to the theater right. in her seat, and I'm across the street with my hat over my eyes like this, you know. And I do not want to be seen because I just was so appalled by what I was watching. So um, it's it it can be hard in those smaller theaters, but it's so intimate. It's so beautiful to have a smaller theater too. Uh, I've always been interested in the audience. You know, when I was a stage manager, and um, once I had the show under my belt, and I didn't have to be locked into the script looking at it, you know, mm -hmm. or if I had a long period where I didn't have any cues to call, lights or sound or anything like that, mm -hmm. I like to have a little hole made in the scenery, and I would like to watch the audience. Once I understood what the show was about, Yeah. You know, and I knew the actors were good. I knew where the laughs were, and I would anticipate the laughs and wait for them. And I'd be looking through this little hole here. And my father always said, don't look at the audience, don't. And I just never paid attention to that. You know, I just like to, to watch the audience having fun. Yeah, yeah. And when, the, when, the, when these great comics, uh, who I had the, the honor of working with in summer stock, I did eight shows uh, every summer for four years, and I would look look through here and, and the play's going on and I'm waiting for this moment to happen. I'm waiting for the, 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 the beauty of the dialogue between the two people to, to result in this tremendous comic response. You know, that was what was fun for me, yeah. you know, and uh, they were so good, uh, these people, that um, they almost never failed. And, so I, 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 like, I like to be aware of the audience. I see them out there. It doesn't bother me that I see them. It pisses me off sometimes if they're asleep. Sure, of course. I did one play where somebody, uh, the wife enjoyed the play very much, and she dragged her husband there, and he brought a book, a big, thick book, and he never took his uh, nose out of the book the entire, entire play. Wow. I've gotten in trouble with audiences, though. Uh, 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 an audience member threw something at me in the middle of the play, Wow. Hit me in the head. <laughs> uh, I was playing in a play by Arabal, Fernando Arabal, the great Spanish playwright. And he had directed us in this play. It was very hard to take because it was about uh, prisoners of conscience in uh, uh, Franco's Spain. So right. we're, in, we're in a cage. Mm -hmm. Every yeah. other scene is in the cage. And then every other scene is a dream, a fantasy of these prisoners. We all had our heads shaved totally. And um, these scenes were about some kind of betrayal. So it was, I, I wish I could tell you all about it because it, it was truly uh, grotesque effects in this play. Um, and uh, we had our fair share of, of walkouts uh, because people couldn't, um, face what we were portraying, especially right. Catholics had a problem with it. Okay. Catholics, because uh, a large part of the abuse was coming from the priests, you know. Right. right. So, so this guy uh, was very upset, I guess. I am, I am in my, my fellow prisoner is trying to console me. I have just found out that my wife, while I'm in prison, is uh, having an affair with this military man. Uh, and I am weeping in right. my fellow prisoner's arms. I'm weeping with grief. Mm -hmm. 
so angry. And this man stands up in the audience. We had these, these sort of kind of fancy programs that were heavy. They were heavier than the ordinary kind of program. And he crumpled it together, crumpled it in anger. Walked onto the stage, which he had these ramps going from all four sides of the stage. Walked on, took aim at me and threw the crumpled up program through the bars of the cage. It hit me in the head. Wow. <clears throat> Did you stay in character? Scene. What? Did you stay in character? Stayed in character, of course I did. Okay. Now the cage looked like you couldn't get out of it, but we knew how to get out because we were acrobats, you know. We had, we had uh, worked in the open theater. We had worked with Grotowski. And um, uh, so we could do almost anything physically, you know. So we knew how to get out of this cage in the dark, ready for the next scene. Right. So he throws this thing, hits me in the head, and walks across the stage, down the ramp, and out. Wow. The lights go to black, and I am out of that cage like that. And I follow him out. <laughs> and I chase him all the way out of the theater. And it was second floor and with a steep set of stairs. And he, he was ahead of me. And I'm, I, I'm, I see this uh, large uh, uh, ashtray. You know, it's a, like a tubular metal. Yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a metal ashtray at the top full of ashes. Yeah. And I pick this thing up and I throw it down the stairs at him. Jesus. And I just missed him. Just missed him. Wow. Well, I wish I could have hit the bastard. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about disrespect. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in the audience's reaction, you know. Wow. So, could you, so you worked. You said you worked with Grotowski, is that? We did, we did for uh, a short tell us, time. Tell us about that experience, please. Well, uh, you know, the open theater, uh, we had uh, um, part of our training in the open theater for those four years, we would, we would uh, meet every day in our loft and we would uh, work uh, physically. We'd do our warm up, which was based on Grotowski's exercises, which we had learned from a book that was published about the same time that I joined the Open Theater, around 1967. And um, it was called Towards a Poor Theater. Yes. So um, Grotowski was coming to um, America to perform at the Washington Square Methodist Church. So we yes. all got tickets, or we got invited somehow. And uh, we asked Grotowski to come and work with us. Uh -huh. So he, uh, he came to work with us. Now, he had certain rules. Mm -hmm. It had to be a clean rehearsal space. Yeah, right. We were working over on Bleecker Street above a bar. The wall, <laughs> walls, <laughs> floor, ceiling painted black. Wow. So we cleaned it. He came and looked at it and he didn't approve. Wow. We had to clean it again. We cleaned it again. He came back and looked at it. He still didn't approve. So we had to clean it again. So we finally achieved uh, uh, something that, that pleased Jersey. And uh, <laughs> uh, so he comes. Oh, yeah, the rules were uh, no smoking. And we all smoked, right. <laughs> most of us. Yeah. That's why I have <laughs> this trouble today. Right. We all smoked. And uh, no food or drink. Right. No food or drink, no cigarettes. No water? Uh, water, probably, you can yeah, wear. Yeah, yeah. So make sure. So uh, he comes in for the first session, the first day with us, to work with us. And his great actor, uh, Richard uh, Trieslich. Yes, uh, genius. However man. you say his name, I'm, I'm yeah. terrible. I can't pronounce the Polish names. I don't know Polish. I think you get but, it correctly. But he came with, with Grotowski. Mm -hmm. And... He was our hero. I mean, we wanted to be him. We wanted to be super actors. We wanted to be able to do things physically right. and vocally that uh, nobody else could do. Yeah. You know, we were just were passionate about this. So in comes Grotowski and sits at a table at one end of the room. He's wearing a suit and a tie, sunglasses. And he's smoking. <laughs> he's smoking nonstop, and he's got a Coca-Cola. 
<laughs> and I was addicted to Coca-Cola at the time. I had several every day. I mean, it was really insane. And I was really addicted to cigarettes. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't have them for hours. Couldn't have them. Couldn't have them. No, no food or drink except for him. So he's doing that. And uh, so we worked on exercises, you know, and he had, had severe criticisms for us. Severe. Do you, and do you talked recall? about his methodology, you know, and, and there was Richard, his... Uh, this great actor, this hero, and are doing things that we wanted to be able to do. So we just we just did what he told us to do, and and bravely, uh, bravely uh, uh, kept on, you know, for the whole session, however long it was. And we did this for a few days, a few days, and then we went at night to see the plays in the Washington Square Methodist Church. Yeah. It was quite quite thrilling. And why did I bring Grotowski up at this point? Because uh, you, you were talking about the Spanish play you did. And... Oh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, here we are in this play. You know, this was a strange play. Uh, they put handcuffs on the flowers, which is a, a line by uh, oh. Lorca, by, by, uh, okay, yeah. by Lor the poet Lorca. Yes. And, um, and they put handcuffs on the flowers. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And... <laughs> It was a, a great experience. We, it ran for six months. Great, it ran for six months. Yes. But there were strange things about it. For example, when you came into the theater, say you guys were coming into the theater, or let's say, I'll, I'll put it this way, it's more dramatic to put it this way. You come to the theater with, and you bring your wife to it, to the theater. And you walk in, you get your ticket, you walk through these two doors, they close behind you, and you're in total darkness. Oh, yeah. You hear screams. You hear metal against metal, heavy iron doors clanging shut. Wow. You are separated from your wife forcibly. A hand comes on the back of your neck, wham, and forces your head down past your waist. Someone says, one of us says to you, it's us doing it. Yeah, it's dystopian. In the dark, in the pitch dark. Of course, we've been, we've been in there and we can, we can see because, it's, you know, we can see. But they can't. They just come out of the bright lights and they're, they're blind as bats. They can't do anything. And, and um, this is, don't say anything. Don't move. And then we take you into the theater and sit you down on a bench hard, hard bench, no cushion, no back. And then, and who knows where your wife is by now? Your wife's some other part of the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. <laughs> Except that some people, some people didn't laugh. <laughs> Like getting grabbed on the neck and have their head fall. Really? Go figure. <laughs> and Arabal used to be in there in the dark with us. He grabbed my friend's arm. She is a real theater goer. And, and uh, he grabs her arm in the dark and bites it. He leaves his teeth marks on her bare arm. Jesus Whoa. Christ. Really? Charles Mingus, the great jazz bassist, came, and, and Charles was a large man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, he struck out in the dark against whoever, and threw in, and one of our actors ended up going up against the wall, you know, and sliding down, back down. And it got bad, and, and we finally said to Arabal, we you know, we aren't going to do this anymore. We can't, we can't do this before the show. People are complaining, you know, uh, one of my friends came with his girlfriend and she was on uh, she was on kidney dialysis and she had the sores in her arm from where they stuck the thing in, you know, and somebody <laughs> grabbed her arm in. It was, it was, he said, all right, all right. He didn't have any English. He didn't know anything English except go Mets. And, uh, <laughs> go Mets. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, so he finally said, okay, okay, but we must have um, a violinist on stage. Yeah. Um, instead. So we had to dress this guy in army fatigues and he, he could play the violin and he played the violin. It was, um, it was a great, it was such a great experience, you know. Yeah. That play was a, that was a thrill to play that play. But it was, it was, 
dramatic and and it's everything theater should be you know yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Hmm? absolutely that sounds amazing could you could you talk a bit now about um working at the irish rep and some of the stories you have from doing plays there there's been allegations um against you uh some people have said that you've fallen asleep during a production while on stage is this true or false no this is true i actually fell asleep twice uh, but that was uh, with the uh, ben gazara in uh, the, the o'neill play huey oh. Not yeah. not the Irish I, I forgot that I had a I, I forgot that I had a matinee and um, yeah I, I spent the night um, uh, enjoying my, myself and a little too much I didn't get any sleep and so when I got to the theater for the matinee I just was wrecked I mean I was wrecked and um, I fell asleep twice on the stage You're just standing there fell total total <laughs> well I hallucinated I was hallucinating because I also probably hadn't had much to eat. Right. So I thought I saw, <laughs> you know, it takes place in a hotel, <laughs> in a hotel lobby. <laughs> There's no other <laughs> characters in, in the play but me and Ben Gazzara. I don't do drugs. I do not do drugs. <laughs> but I said to myself, while I'm acting with Ben Gazzara, this matinee, I said, what? What are, they, what are these two bellboys doing on stage with red coats and brass buttons? Yeah. And I look in the audience, and um, I, was, I, I don't know how he got there. <laughs> I saw Fred Astaire sitting in the audience with his, his legs crossed, very relaxed. You know, Fred was always very relaxed, a relaxed performer. You know, it was the ease with which he danced. And he was just sitting there, a uh, large, very large figure. And he had his legs crossed. And he wore a, instead of a belt, he had a, a necktie, a stylish necktie. And he's just just watching the play. I said, hmm, that's, in, that's interesting. <laughs> ah, ah, oh my God. And I fell asleep twice. And Gazzara had to wake me up. He had to holler across the stage, hey, hey! <laughs> yeah. But, you, yeah. but you've never fallen asleep at the Irish Rep. That's, that's... No. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. I've had a director fall asleep during the rehearsal while I'm acting. Right. I won't yeah. name any names. Right. Okay. He's a male. Male. Female. He's male. Not a female. Male. Oh, oh. Male. Yeah. Yeah. Right. From Cabin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, you um, oh, the Irish Rep. The Irish Rep. So, uh, oh man, uh, Charlotte Moore, my wife had done a couple of plays there. Yes. And yeah. uh, so uh, we came down to get tickets for a show we were gonna see and, and we said, our Charlotte and uh, Kieran around. Oh no, they just left for lunch. Mm -hmm. Where'd they go? She said, well, they usually go to this uh, one, the box office guy said, so they usually go to this one restaurant over there, go check it out. So we went over there and um, there they were. So we sat down in the booth with them and we love seeing them and they love seeing us. It's, uh, it was great. And then um, Charlotte, I said, what do you do? Uh, she says, well, I'm about to go into rehearsal. And she looks at, uh, at us. We just stopped in by chance. Yeah. She says so. Uh, they're doing a musical version of The Importance of Being Earnest called Earnest in Love. And she said, you know, you could play Miss Prism, she points to my wife. And Peter, you'd be terrific as the Reverend Chasuble. And, um, oh yeah, um, and um, she says, well, do you want to do it? And Kieran says to Charlotte, Charlotte, what are you talking about? You don't even know if they can sing. <laughs> and she says, oh, they sing well enough. And that was it. That was the casting session. Wow. You know what I mean? So uh, 
I've done a bunch of shows there now, and I just love working with them. Uh, I love I love the theater. I love the people that work there. Um, it's a very human place. Look, the theater is the most human of all the arts. Yeah. And the reason is we are the, you know, it's like uh, a painter has paints and brushes, paint, paint is the medium. Mm -hmm. And the theater has us. We are the medium. Mm -hmm. So here we are the most in the most human of, uh, of the arts. And uh, certain theaters are more human than others. I don't want to name names negatively, but certain theaters are definitely not the most human of places. And the, the ones that I'm discussing in this episode uh, are um, more human than others. You know, the Atlantic, well the, uh, the Irish Rep Ensemble Studio Theater, Mm -hmm. uh, run by Billy Carden. I've been there was 35 years, I probably, and they've produced almost all my plays. Indeed. Could you and talk I've directed, about yeah. directed many plays there. Can, can I name some of the plays you've written? Can I name Pardon? some of them? Great titles. Can I, can, can I name some of the plays you've written? Can I name them? Can I name them? I have a list here. Dave wants to name them. Can I oh, name yeah, them? you can yeah. name them, sure. Well, I'll name them and you can name the ones I missed. Uh, Bicycle Boys. Yeah, that was an early one. Yeah. yeah. Lost and Found. Yep. Yeah. Last Chance Texaco. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pastoral. 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 Yeah. And That's a sequel, a sequel to Lost and Found. I write short plays because right. I do so many things. It's hard for me to uh, sustain long uh, right. of concentration on something. So I'm much better at writing something short. I've written full-length plays. You've had plays published. Yes. What, what? In, in the Devil's Bathtub, that was published, right? That was, yeah. That's uh, Accident was produced. Accident. Uh, I've done uh, five uh, very personal plays. Uh, autobi I call them autobiographical fiction. Yes. So talk to us about them. Well, um, <clears throat> It's, it goes back to my father. My father, my father could laugh at anything and would laugh at anything. And this, and and he could, he could take uh, what what would be a tragic situation. And um, I'll give you an example. Right. Uh, my father was a diabetic in at the end of his life, and um, he um, he um, suffered amputation amputations uh, because of circulatory problems caused by the diabetes. So one day, I know he was going to have some, uh, something, something's wrong with his foot. So I get a book in the mail once that my father wrote. He wrote it by hand. And it was about this big, a little book, a booklet, but it had a harder cover than that it had been stapled together with pages inside and on the outside it said the story of your father's foot and so uh you open it up and then it says chapter one very handsomely hand lettered with color and everything chapter one and you turn the page again and there is a photograph that my father took of his foot with an instamatic camera, and he put his foot up on a footstool, and he click. He took a picture. Oh, oh! I left out something real important. There's the foot, and he had taken a black magic marker, and he had made an X on the toes that were going to be removed, so that the guy, the doctor, wouldn't remove the wrong toes. Wow! And he was going to lose about three toes. So he had this X. You turn the page and it says chapter two. And you, and you turn the page and there's the same foot on the same footstool, but those toes are gone. And where the stitches are, are little black X's made of the surgical thread. So, you know, he, he would 
look at things which many people would say are tragic or yes. uh, really uh, uh, upsetting. Right. And um, he would uh, turn them into something colorful and funny and uh, strangely, you know, a lot of people, I put this, this in the play, this book, and um, called My Father's Funeral. And this was stimulated by my father's funeral, my father's real funeral, this play. You know, I show myself doing the eulogy. My father's in the coffin. My son comes in with a shovel and starts digging a grave right next to where I'm giving the eulogy and, I, and won't tell me who it's for and argues with me about my father, what kind of a man my father was what kind of a man his grandfather was. And my mother's in the front row, and my brothers and my sister, they're all in the front row. And I use the audience as the mourners. Oh, very good. Yeah. So usually it's something that really happened to me. Like the accident that I had, I decided, uh, idiotically, I decided to go uh, to, I wanted to do something with my son where we could bond together. He was 15 and, uh, and we also wanted to do something physical that would, would uh, um, you know, be good for us physically. So um, he said, we should do something together, Dad. And I said, yeah, well, well listen, you like to rollerblade. Why don't we rollerblade together? And uh, so we went out and got a, me a pair of rollerblades. And uh, we went around the Central Park, uh, the Great Lawn there a couple of times. And then we're coming home. We're about a block and a half from my house. And going down a hill, I hit a, a pile of uh, nuts, you know, mm -hmm. which some damn squirrel had piled up there on the sidewalk. And uh, hit, boom, and went into the air and landed on my shoulder and um, broke it so badly that I was in the hospital for two weeks and, and it was really bad, really, really, really bad. Did I mention the Spike Lee film? Yes. An accident yeah. with a Spike Lee film where he put the gun in my hand? Yes. Where I found, uh, I had to arrest uh, the killer, you know, son of Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's what happened. I, I, I hurt myself so badly. But that, so that, that ended up on stage. I, I've done five, about five, uh, five plays based on my life. Mm -hmm. And with my kids, I've put my kids in the plays and my wife in the plays. Great. Yeah. Did you have a, a writing mentor, or someone to help you with structure and stuff like that? Or did you just have it naturally yourself? Uh, no, I just, um, I took poetry classes in college. I love to, uh, I love poetry very much. I spend, I buy a lot of poetry, books of poetry. But it's a very hard craft. It's a very hard art to master. Mm. And um, I wrote a few poems, a few that are any good at all. Not much, not much. And so I had a wonderful teacher in college for that. But no, I basically just kept my eyes and ears open and learned from the work that I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and tried to, uh, you know, achieve the effect uh, that I wanted without, I didn't have a, a class, you know. But with the new dramatist, we would often, we'd do a draft, we could have a reading and then hear the comments. You know, you choose, a, you choose someone mm -hmm. to come and observe and criticize you. At the actor's studio, you come and you read a script, you read a new play, and uh, then everybody in the unit gets to criticize you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what kind of director are you? Well, you know, my work with Arthur Penn, which I've mentioned at length, uh, influenced me all my life uh, from then on, from the moment that I worked with him. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm capable of, I'm capable of being one kind of a director, which is the kind of a director who can tell everybody where to go, what to do, and make a production mm -hmm. that would be terrific. But I don't like to do that, and I, I don't do it. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is to get really good actors 
and uh, agree with them about what the play is about in general, not come in with any fixed ideas, and to find out what it's about day by day, so that by the end of rehearsal, when we get into tech, we know, we've discovered through the process of the work what the play is about. And I have discovered what I think it's about and I start crafting moments. It's not that I, I don't just let anybody do whatever they want to. I establish terms. I m make sure we stay with the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about past, the past, past events. Mm -hmm. um, and circumstances, what are the present circumstances? How do they make us behave? How do they make us act? What do we want? What is our objective? You know, uh, that affected me the rest of my life, the way Arthur Penn directed, because he was looking when we went to Stockbridge in 66 to do uh, The Skin of Our Teeth, and, and uh, he wanted it to work in a different way than he was working on Broadway because Broadway costs so much money. There isn't time. There isn't much time. And the movies, as you know, is, is, is there really is no time because time is money. Right. And so you don't get much chance to rehearse. So we had a company in Stockbridge. I keep going back to Stockbridge. I've written about it at length. That was unbelievable that summer. Imagine this in the summer, summer theater. Anne Bancroft, Jean Hackman, Dustin Hoffman, James Patterson, Estelle Parsons, um, Frank Langella. And so it was a, a tremendous uh, mm -hmm. gang of people, extremely talented. Right. With minds that it was creative minds, you know, not people that were just going to sit around and wait to be told to do something. They yeah. were going to come in prepared with the circumstances and their own research or whatever they do, however sure. they do it. And they would offer things to Arthur. Hackman and Hoffman went to school together, right? At the actor's studio. Yeah, I think they, they were in New York at the same time. I don't yeah. know if they were in school together, but I think they were roommates. Right, but right. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know. They were voted least likely to succeed, were they? I, hmm? I heard a, a myth or maybe a story where uh, Hoffman and Hackman were voted least likely to uh, succeed at the actor's studio. <clears throat> oh, I don't know that the actor's studio said that, but um, yeah. maybe it was the, neither one of them book. had anything to do really with the actor's studio per se. But, yeah. um, I could imagine somebody, some, there's always somebody going to vote you least likely to succeed. Right, right, yeah. right. And they could be right, yeah. but they're very often wrong. and Just misunderstand where you're coming from. And you're coming sure. from, yeah. from well, a different place. Yeah, and speaking of criticism, you, you also are a critic, Peter, right? Could you tell I was a critic for three years on a, a magazine. Yeah, uh, how was that? Which had been started by the, uh, Charles Mingus's wife. And it was a jazz magazine called Changes. And oh. for three years, I was uh, uh, their drama critic. Uh, so I wrote every month, I wrote um, a 3,000 word piece about a play, or now and then about a film. And I also covered dance sometimes. And um, uh, I wrote three pieces describing my work at the o Open Theater, which is how that job started. And that was a crucial job for me because, you know, when you're a critic, you know, most people say, oh, I didn't like that play. You know, oh, I don't like that guy's writing. Uh, it's much, you can't, that's not criticism, you know. That's just yeah. talking about your own personal uh, feelings. Criticism is, is a, an art. And uh, yes. I think sometimes it can be an important art. And it was so good for me to be, uh, have to every month marshal my thoughts and um, put into words what I felt about a work of art done by somebody else. Now, I loved appreciating things. I didn't like so much uh, uh, criticizing, uh, you know, uh, the way some critics can demolish the, the artist, demolish you. Yeah. Um, I never, I, I could do it, 
And sometimes I did it if I was angry enough at what I was seeing. I didn't like doing it. What I liked was loving something and explaining why it was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite film director right now uh, for quite a while is Th uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. And um, I, I'm working on something which I would love to end up as a book, an appreciation of his films, all of his films. We've done about nine of them now. And, yeah. uh, you know, if I, I've made notes, I've got notes and notebooks, and uh, it would really be an appreciation of the films of, P.T. Anderson. That's what it, that's what it would end up being. Yeah, and, uh, um, I think Peter, he's worth recognizing. Yeah. Which, which of his films uh, stands out the most to you? Which is your in favorite? Films? Yeah, of P.T. Of Anderson's? Yeah. Which one is your well, favorite? Well, you know, I get very apprehensive because if you love uh, an artist's work, it makes you nervous to go uh, to go to the newest work sure. because we. Every artist has to fail sometime, right? Sure. You know, and you don't want this to be the one. You don't want to. You don't even want to witness it. It's just too painful to think of him failing. Now, I haven't seen him fail yet, in my opinion. Okay. Um, certain of his films um, are less meaningful, let's say, than others. Yeah. But um, well, I'd have to start with uh, Magnolia, which is maybe one of my favorite films in the world. Right. But his recent films have been so breathtakingly created. There Will Be Blood. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the Master. <clears throat> um, and Phantom Thread. Right. Right there. You've got three, three of the films, uh, of yeah. the greatest films of modern times, I think, right there. Boogie Nights was fun as well. Boogie Nights is fun. You know, it's, you know, even he admits, we were talking about Sam Shepard writing uh, long monologues. Well, even he admits now that um, Boogie Nights and Magnolia might be too long. You know, he right. could lose 20 minutes at least. You know, uh -huh. I would hate to lose the 20 minutes, though. You know, it's hard when everything that he's creating is so vibrant, amusing, jaw-droppingly awful yeah in its content sure. you, you need to think of losing any of that that's why it's hard to to cut those 20 minutes out you know you know but he he has uh, said in later uh, in more recent times that that maybe he should have listened to uh somebody who was telling him to just yeah. make it a little shorter right right um according to my research you've directed sandra bullock uh, kevin bacon and tommy lee jones on stage yes, i have what what's it like directing a a, Ho a Hollywood star? Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, uh, when I directed them, uh, they weren't Hollywood stars. Oh, okay. Well, then so I'm sure I'm sure question. that it'd be a different experience directing them now. Sure. But as I said, when I when you asked me about what was it like to work with um, Robert De Niro, or what what was my impression of him? Mm -hmm. There was no question. They would, let's start with with Sandra. Um, she had, had just come to New York, I think. It might have been her first and only play. I don't know. I can't remember. It was a play by Larry Ketron. Now, Larry Ketron, a wonderfully talented writer. Um, yes. And this, I thought, was his best play. But I was, sadly, I was one of the only people who thought it was his best play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that doesn't bother me. I mean, I, I have my strong beliefs and I directed it as if it was his best play. And Sandra, um, whatever her experience before we met, she was just perfect in this part. And, and I knew immediately that if she left New York, got mm -hmm. to California, that she was going to be a huge, huge star because she just radiated this wonderful um, quality, you know, wonderful quality. It's like certain people, 
the camera loves and they were born to be on the big screen. You right. know, uh, I am not one of those people. I'm down in the corner with my cigarettes and my milk doing my prop, dealing with my properties, you know, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, Tommy Lee Jones, I had to fire an actor uh, from the leading role in a play that I was doing at the public theater. And he, he tricked me in um, auditions. He fooled me. And uh, we knew soon after we started rehearsals that he was going to have to go. Uh, and so we opened the show. We did it for a couple of weeks. And then um, Joe Papp was going to close it. And I went to Joe Papp and said, no, we don't want to close it. We want to recast and go back into rehearsal and have another go at it. And he asked uh, Bernie Gersten about the money, whether we could afford to do that. Bernie said, yes. So we did it. And now Tommy Lee Jones is available. <clears throat> and he was everything that I needed in the part. And, you know, there's a line from, 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 uh, son, from um, Don Quixote where they're worried about who's going to sit where at the table. And, and Sancho Panza says to the uh, host, don't worry, don't worry. Wherever Don Quixote sits is the head of the table. Well, that's like Tommy Lee Jones. Wherever he sits is the head of the table. Oh. The previous guy was a selfish actor. Uh -huh. Maybe he was just going through a selfish period in his life. I hope so. Mm -hmm. But, um, he planted himself center stage and refused to move. Tommy Lee didn't care. Wherever he was, turned out to be right. the head of the table. Yeah. And he was perfect. And it was a wonderful cast, a play by Jack Gilhooley, uh, one of my oldest friends, uh, filled with wonderful character actors who I still think of so lovingly. Um, and Tommy Lee was great. And we, when we did uh, JFK together, um, I'm just turning my phone off, sorry. Sure. Uh, when we did JFK together, we had a nice little reunion and talked about that show. It was long before that was uh, Tommy had, uh, this was after Tommy had, had gone on to be uh, yeah. rich and famous. And um, who was the other person we talked about? Oh, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, uh, Kevin, Kevin, uh, a cast in a play by John Byrne, a Scottish playwright. Oh, yes. And this is a play called The Slab Boys. Oh, yes, yes. It takes place in Glasgow, and it's about two Irish, two, pardon me, two Catholic uh, Scottish boys right. who are working in a, in a, in a, a carpet factory, and they, they get abused by all the non-Catholics in, in the play, you know. And it's a, it too is a brilliant play, a brilliant play. But it was a kind of a play which is going to get a lot of bad productions because they aren't going to know what it really is about, you know? And um, so uh, I directed it at, at the Actors Theater of Louisville. There are many stories associated with this play, which I will not go into, they're just too, too long and complex, but uh, after we um, we did the play, uh, John uh, Byrne, who's um, the playwright, who had come over to work with us on the play, he asked me to write the um, forward to the play. Yes. And so I did. Then it got complicated. Two of the actors in the play bought the rights to the play. Wow. It's a smart thing to do. Yeah, right? yeah. Like a job. You know, uh, they were very good in the play, and they bought the play. So they said, we're going to do it in New York. So we did it in New York at the Hudson Guild Theater, another tall, small little theater, which is a lovely space, sure. you know, small. And so we did it. We did a, a, a production uh, that was in some ways better than the one that we did down at Actors Theater of Louisville. Uh, but the uh, the actor who bought the play, didn't like working with Kevin Bacon. 
Oh, for right. some reason, I don't know what his problem was. Yeah. I thought they worked well together, you know, but he he just wouldn't uh, wouldn't have him in the play. Interesting, right? And he was now the producer, so he could say no. Oh, right. Yeah. So an actor named Daniel Jarrell uh, flew over from England to audition for it for me, and um, and he was terrific, and I cast him, and. Uh, and we, we had a wonderful production, wonderful, just wonderful. But we didn't have Kevin, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's hard to get, um, you know, every, every show is sort of calling out for, let's say, a certain actor or one, a choice of one of a number of certain actors uh, with a certain um, uh, Name, everybody wants you to have somebody with a certain name quality, you know, sure. and um, I don't mind it, you know, I always said if somebody said to me of a play that I wrote for my wife, uh, I wanted to cast it, it was going to go to Broadway, this is a hypothetical, totally, mm -hmm. totally hypothetical, but they said we, we've, uh, we want Jane Fonda to play the part that your wife played down at the Irish Rep. Yeah. And uh, she wants to do it. I well, still pick your wife. Yeah. What? Your wife is way hotter than Jane Fonda. Well, years ago, I, I used her as an example. I suppose I could use someone else. Let's say uh, Sandra Bullock. Uh, yeah. The point is, depending on where you're working yes. and what the terms are, certain things are undis understandable yes. and undeniable. Yeah. Uh, so maybe then you say, well, okay, I understand your point of view. Print up the posters and let's do it. And I Wait. would suffer. I would suffer greatly at the hands of my wife. <laughs> Wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just speaking of stars, you've also uh, acted opposite Billy Crudup on Broadway. In Arcadia, uh, love him. Huh? Yeah, yeah. In Arcadia, yeah. Yeah, by Tom Stoppard. I, yeah, what are I, you? I adore him. Yeah. I adore Tom Stoppard. I mean, I I tell you, gentlemen, uh, I'm a lucky guy. I mean, I have worked with great people, great people. Six degrees of separation as well, right? Six degrees. That was a great job. Was yeah. that the original production? Yeah, original. It, right. Uh, Lincoln and, uh, Judgment at Nuremberg. Judgment what? at Nuremberg. Judgment, Judgment at Nuremberg. Nuremberg. Yeah, I, I understand. And I also, not only did I play a German judge who was on trial, but I understudied Maximilian Schell, uh, which was wonderful to do. And you, some years before, I'd been in a play called Poor Murderer with Maximilian Schell's sister, Maria, who I was always in love with. So that was the thrill to be, to be in the same play with her. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful actress. What a wonderful actress, and, and so beautiful. Um, yeah. Um, West Side Story. West Side Story. Oh yeah. my goodness! I mean, that I couldn't believe. You know, three. I was only in it for three months. Um, Can you dance? No, I didn't have to dance. I didn't have to sing either. Oh, I who, who, did you, who did you play? Did you play a no, Puerto Rican? I played the guy that owns the owns the candy store where the kids hang out. Oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so most of the time on that show, I uh, I got to uh, sit in the audience listening to the music and the and watch the dancing. Right. Um, and uh, that was just thrilling, just thrilling. And you know, uh, our. Um, David Saint, the director who's directed me a number of times, he, yes. he was uh, assistant to uh, Arthur Lawrence, who wrote West Side Story and directed this production at the Palace Theater, where my father always wanted to perform. He wanted to perform at the Palace because in the days of vaudeville, that was the peak, that was the ultimate. Right. Place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there I was up there. My father had died, I'm sorry to say, he never saw me in the play, but uh, I just would. I would just look up in the flies and say, oh my God, here I am where my father wanted to be. You know, it was so thrilling. Right. And, uh, so um, Arthur Lawrence had a, rep had a reputation for being a real 
tough cookie. Yeah. And uh, I had never met him. Uh, I got asked to, to do the part. And so David Saint put me into the role with a, about a one hour rehearsal before my first performance. And uh, after I did it, I came downstairs in the basement and I was heading up to watch the rest of the show from the, from the audience, from back of the back of the house. And I walk, I come down the stairs and there is Arthur Lawrence coming towards me. Peter, come here. And immediately, he was a little guy, but geez, he had a lot of uh, negative energy going. And, <laughs> uh, you know, perfectly dressed, and sort of golfing out, golfing outfit and everything. And uh, he says, so he kicked the stage managers out of the stage managing room and he says, sit down. Oh, here we go. And he slams the door behind him and sits down and looks at me and he says, your problem is you think this is a musical. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I was so stunned by, uh, and he went into the story of, of, of what it meant to the people of this particular neighborhood, the Puerto Ricans, to face the, you know, for the sharks to face the jets. And it was very psychological. And it wasn't particularly a, a long involved conversation, but he was very helpful to me. Mm -hmm. to um to lay out uh, more 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 uh more clearly than was than was um than david was able to do in the brief rehearsal that we had so but he laid out some stuff for me that was you know that i could use interior interior uh work and uh, to make my performance better so uh, he said, okay, uh, uh, enjoy, your, enjoy the, doing the show. And I, I left the room, sort of breathed a sigh of relief. But he, he was a hard nut, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. He called a few days later, he called the, the whole company into the back of the Palace Theater, and we're all sitting there. And um, I'm trying to hide behind a guy, uh, big, the big cop. Uh, in the show. I'm trying to hide behind him. And, and Arthur Lawrence is pacing up and down uh, in his lime green golfing outfit, you know, and uh, pacing up and down, and I, I'm trying to hide from him. And uh, suddenly he stops halfway up the aisle and he says, Peter, <laughs> you're very good. Wow. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, oh my God, I don't have to hide behind this guy anymore, you know. Yeah, and and then he became very critical of a couple of members of the cast, and uh, literally, you know, reduced them to tears in front of everybody. Brilliant. Just brutally, brutally uh, criticized them. Jesus. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, this is a show that that people are paying uh, two hundred and fifty dollars for a seat. Yeah. And he he had it had been running for two years, and he wanted to make sure that everybody got their money's worth. Sure. There was no time for um, monkeying around. You gave for all, every performance. Yeah. You know. You you were also in Dinner at Eight on Broadway. Dinner at Eight. That was uh, yeah. Yeah. Carousel. And Carousel. Carousel. Oh, Carousel. That's by directed by Nick Heitner, Nicholas oh, okay. Heitner from the National Theatre. You know. Very good. Yeah. yeah. That's where it was done first. So they brought it to Lincoln Center, and uh, oh, that was a thrill. I did that for six months. Um, you know, and I don't dance. You asked if I dance. Yeah. Uh, I never had time. For, you can't do everything. Sure, sure. Maybe if some geniuses can, but I can't do everything. Ed, and I never. I can do everything. I can do everything, apparently. Well, yeah. I know. I suspected that about you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I he would, does everything, but he can't do it very well. Just kidding. I, would go, <laughs> I would go up on stage uh, for Carousel. Oh, okay. I would go up on stage uh, and um, just stand in the wings and watch the dancers warm up. Nice. And, oh, and then I was in the first that beautiful um, opening um, scene where, where the stage gets set with the carousel and everything. And it was just a just a great thrill, a great thrill. And Nick Heitner, 
you know, I worked at that period of time. I'd worked with with five or six British directors, and uh, the British directors, you know, American actors and art, artists have had trouble with the British, in the sense that yes. uh, we get so many British actors over here. Yeah, uh, I'd like to see your green cards, by the way, before we finish this. But uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we get so many British actors over here and, and directors, and they're supposed to be an exchange program, you know? Right. Well, I've never been invited to come to England right. as an actor. Yeah. And when I go to England and the uh, customs man looks at my passport, he says, what do you do for a living, Mr. Maloney? And I say, I'm an actor. He says, when are you leaving? <laughs> yeah. You sound so, like a protectionist, Peter. Are you a protectionist? Um, I put it this way. I have served on a few committees at Actors' Equity. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there was one point, I think, when it got kind of bad. Okay. Uh, I saw Rip Torn. Oh, legend. <laughs> at one of our meetings. Uh, weep, weep, because he uh, was not given the chance to play this Greek tragedy. And they felt they had to bring Kenneth Haig over from England. Uh. And uh, it was just a kind of insecurity that was raised in everybody because, you know, how many times, well, no, you're not American, but, but when we, you know, when I hear my grandmother and aunts and especially women talk about, oh, nobody can act like the English. You know, I love all the English television shows because they can, they can act so well, don't you think? You know, and I want to say, uh, uh, they're good, you know, but how about me? Yeah, sure. Um, That's still going on. Though. Maybe it's, uh, the, ac maybe it's huh? the accent. People, maybe just people in this country respond to the British accent. The allure of the voice. The yeah. allure of the accent. Maybe that's it, or the teapots, or whatever, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I always found American actors to be more naturalistic, myself. Well, American actors bring their own, their own thing. There's individualism. It's, it's hard for the English to do, you know. Sure. Um, uh, so, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm I'm really over it. I'm really over it. And, uh, so I've been uh, at one point. I've then worked with five or six English directors, and I must say, I I never had a problem at all. And I, I cherished working with them. I worked with John Caird, Trevor Nunn, uh, Michael Apted, uh, Ian Softley. Wow. Uh, you know. Uh, it was great to work with him, just great. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a problem. And Nick Heitner, I worked with him on three projects, including The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Wow, yeah. And with Daniel Day-Lewis, and it was just, it was wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just, before, we're gonna ask you your opinion um, on current events, but before we do that, I, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about writing your autobiography and how that experience was um if you'd like to talk a bit about your autobiography for our viewers well i haven't written an autobiography yes of course i haven't yeah. right he hasn't yeah. written okay oh i thought you yeah. wrote no i thought wait yeah. i must have yeah. misheard I'm, or misread i'm going to apologize to the audience wow. i thought you wrote an autobiography yeah, i'm going to apologize to the audience on i apologize too okay can you <laughs> Okay, can we wow. move on? Sorry. Look, I love I, <laughs> my boss. Yeah, that was a yeah. An write an autobiography. I think I think I can get away with writing a memoir. A oh. memoir. Thank you. That's what I meant. <laughs> Did you write a memoir? Have you written a memoir? You know, I'm working on a memoir now about the open theater, about my four years of the open theater. I think that would be good, and I think it would be interesting. And right. I think actually because of Joe Chaikin and his the 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 the, the reverence with which he is held by uh, theater artists all over the world, I think I could sell it. I mean, let's be honest, the book should, should ultimately have an audience sure. Sure. And willing to pay for the book to find out what, what that, those four years were like. Yeah. So I think that would be very interesting. And uh, I've written um, a couple of um, memoirs. One was about Ben Gazzara in Huey. That's been published. 
then um, another one about Stockbridge, all these wonderful artists in Stockbridge in, in the summer of uh, 66 and what it was like to do these breathtaking plays with Arthur Penn, the skin of our teeth, George Tabori directing The Merchant of Venice as performed by the inmates of a concentration camp for the Nazi high command. Wow. Jesus. And that was an amazing experience. Wow. And then the third playwright that I worked with that summer was resulted in one of my long-term uh, friendships, and that's with Murray Shiskow, the, the comic writer who was famous for the play Love, uh, The Typists and the Tiger, and um, uh, I directed a number of his plays over the years. And he also is the guy that... Uh, had the idea for the movie Tootsie. And um, so he's a, he's a, a brilliant, brilliant um, comic writer. He's a, 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 an absurdist, you know. He's a, I would put him in the category of theater of the absurd with Ionesco, um, who I also worked with in Stockbridge in uh, 1969 a play of play with him and he came to be with us for the entire rehearsal period wow how was he yeah that must have been a trip well like like um Arabal, he didn't have any english he knew the only english he knew was my wife has been kidnapped <laughs> and um uh, i forget the other phrase that he knew <laughs> but um he was a clown he was a funny guy you know a know. clown with a great Sure. A, unbelievable imagination, just unbelievable. Yeah. And um, I treasure that experience of having worked with him. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's, it's not all about me, although it seems like it is because we've been going on now for how many hours? Almost nine, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, um, but, but it's who, who, as my father said, it's who you work with and- Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's, that's made my life so happy, you know. So, so are you officially retired from, uh, from acting right now? Um, <clears throat> I've not made any announcement. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Oh, and I think perhaps that if I did make an announcement that I was retiring, the reaction from the world and the public would, would be similar to the response uh, that I got when I got off the Greyhound bus from Honeyoy Falls, New York in 1963. Right. I think yeah. the response would be similar. Yeah, I find that hard to believe. I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm thinking a Rolling Stone cover at least. At least, yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. But, uh, so I'm not officially retired. It's just okay. that, you know, I'm loving the writing. I'm just loving the writing. And, um, Good. Uh, uh, write the autobiography. <laughs> no, write the autobiography. But you see, there the, the point about the autobiography is that you'd have to have somebody who'd really want to buy it, and, and that would be too few a number. Uh, I have writer friends who are, you know, brilliant. I mean, um, the, the playwrights that, that at one point I was uh, uh, directing plays by. Uh, Dennis McIntyre, Jack Gilhooley, Ron McClarty, um, and uh, I forget who I'm leaving out now, but this, this the, the man who was then running uh, the Ensemble Studio Theater, I kept submitting plays from these guys that I thought were just wonderful, you know? And he just blew up at me one day and says, what, what is it with you and these Irish writers? Who cares? You know, you see, just all you want to do is these Irish writers. And he, of course, they were, they were American Irish writers. And um, they were just writing very interesting plays, plays that interested me. Sure. Um, my friend Ron McClarty is a novelist and writer, and he couldn't get anybody to be interested in his plays. Wonderful plays. Maybe he wrote maybe 40 plays. Mm -hmm. And, and no, nobody would read them, you know. He had a few productions, but but I found them works of 
genius, you know. I just love them. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, yeah. These guys, were, these guys were great artists, you know, and some of them are still writing. Yeah. You know, and, and continuing to inspire me to keep writing and keep uh, keep putting it, putting the work in, keep putting the work in and see what happens, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess just moving along, um, uh, um, I want to talk about something else. I, I, I'd like to get your opinion on a few uh, of current events um, these days. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you think of the current upheavals we're having in the United States? Do you have any opinion on it? Uh, yeah. Um, Would you like to? I think it's about time, and I think uh, uh, I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm not surprised in the, in the end. I am pleasantly surprised at what's happening. You know, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's just one more step out of that uh, world of uh, innocence that I spoke about in, the, in our first or yeah. second uh, interview. Um, you know, we've, We've been on top for so long, and we don't want to give up the position. Right. Know? And um, we're going to have to do it. I've always thought um, that um, we just have to wait for these old, old white guys to die. Um, and that things would be better then. And I think that's true in a way. You know, it's true for some improvement there. I think there's lots of young people, too, on the right, who uh, would still continue to give us trouble. But um, you know, one of the things we learned when we made the move, the play, The Serpent, was um, that, of course. The greatest thing that could happen was for Adam and Eve to eat that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if they had, hadn't, we wouldn't have any plays whatsoever. Right. We wouldn't have any movies. Mm -hmm. Because it's that tension and it's that, uh, uh, that crossing the line that makes for drama. Yes. You know, yeah. Violating the rules, an assault on the establishment. Yeah. Crossing <laughs> the line. It's um, that's that's what we discovered was that we wouldn't be here if they hadn't broken that rule. Right. That's 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 the fact of it, and um, so you know we've sort of been been able to pretend to be ignorant. For long enough you know we can't pretend anymore because the proof is out there on our cell phones every 10 minutes and so the 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 the, the, the modern technology is enabling the truth to come out the truth right. which so easily uh, can be covered up by um, by politicians or by those who are guilty Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, this thing about the the um, Russians shooting soldiers uh, for um, uh, giving giving the the Afghans money to shoot American soldiers bounty. I mean that that should be the end. That should be the end of it. You know, I mean, I'm willing to wait until the election. But really, what should happen is that. They should go into the uh, squadron, should walk into the White House, walk into the Oval Office, walk up to the desk, take Mr. Trump under the arms, and just walk him out of the building from which he will be exiled forever. Right. I mean, get him out of there, you know. Um, but maybe we can get away with doing it legally. And uh, uh, in the American way, by voting, and uh, right. yeah, hope so. But can I ask you one more question about that? Um, 
if America is no longer the world leader, if it's no longer the cultural leader, the, uh, the financial leader, uh, the military leader, who, who do you think will fill that vacuum? I don't know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, no, okay, yeah. I, I, I think the, the, uh, America, on the face of things, has everything going for it mm -hmm. to be the the big dog. And uh, we've managed it um, on certain levels and in certain ways quite successfully over the decades. What, what this uh, Black Lives Matter means is that we can no longer do it at, at their expense. You know, we can no longer, they have to join us, we have to welcome them. There are going to be reparations. Mm -hmm. um, I did a, a mini series <clears throat> for a wonderful director named John Ehrman. He directed me in three television miniseries, one of which I played Daryl Zanuck, the uh, movie wow. uh, producer. Yes, wow. One of which, uh, anyway, uh, three, three different ones. And in this one, Charlotte Moore played my <laughs> wife. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really? And it's called Queen. Yeah. Um, and, um, at one point, Ossie Davis, oh, the legend. head servant of our family, comes in while we're dining. Yes. We're dining with Martin Sheen and uh, Anne Margaret. Oh. And uh, we're all sitting around the table. I've got big sideburns and I'm a plantation owner, you know. And Ossie Davis comes in to the uh, dining room and announces that another baby has been born to one of the slave women. And I say, I lift a glass. This line got cut from the movie. I lift a glass and I say, with a big smile, an endless supply of free labor. Whoa. Wow. Whoa. Okay. Wow. And I mean, that's what it's been about, you know. Sure. That's what it's been about. It's been about taking advantage of people, exploiting people. Yes. And sometimes we were on the good and the right side of right. Yeah. And, 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 and righteousness. And, and sometimes we were not. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to be on the, 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 the right side, the good side, more often than the other. Right. Now, I don't know that, that we'll be able to uh, establish establish that we'll see what the election but you know things go up and down things go up and down right yeah yeah so um with regards to the election uh in your opinion is there any real difference between a republican party and a democratic the democratic party is there any what are the differences what are the differences yes Well, I'm the son of a Democrat who ran for uh, 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 town supervisor in uh, uh, Honeyoy Falls, New York, that little town near Rochester of 1,500 people. And it's a Republican town. It's always been a Republican town as far as I know. And my father ran as a Democrat for town supervisor. And he lost. This is in maybe 1949 or 1950. Well, some years later, long after I got to New York, a Democrat won the, the job of town supervisor in this little town. And the Republican Party in this little town, in the middle of the winter, held the swearing-in ceremony of the new town officers in the home of one of the most uh, influential Republican men, now dead, and they did not invite this Democrat 
to come and be sworn in. Oh. Mm. And he had to be sworn in outside the closed village hall by a justice of the peace in a snowstorm. Wow. And when he got to his office the next morning, he found that all the files on the computer of the former town supervisor had been erased. Wow. So these, these tactics <clears throat> on the part of the Republicans had been going on for an awfully long time. Now, I'm sure there had been in the Democratic Party some tricksters, mm -hmm. some dirty tricks that went on. It probably wouldn't take long to find some incidents of the same kind of behavior. But so, I just think we're, we're inter interested in different things. You know, I think uh, we're, we're uh, our, our point of view about life in the world, life in a community, uh, our views are just different. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think? So, yeah, no. So I assume you're going to vote for Joe Biden then? Is that... Is that, of course. Yeah, and okay. Could you talk a bit about him? What What do you think of him as a man? Well, you know, I'm not. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about politics. Sure. Okay. I, okay. I had a very political period of my life. Uh, you know, I do what I can. Um, I don't. I don't quite understand why it's so has been so hard for Democrats to find um, a suitable candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, certainly we've had women rise to the occasion in the most exciting way. And uh, that's thrilling. That's thrilling to hear some of these women talk. I, we, I watch the MSNBC too much. And um, to hear these women talk so eloquently and strongly um, is just thrilling to me, you know. So um, I, I don't know why... I, why it's so hard to find a suitable candidate. I don't, I don't quite get that. I don't quite get that. Mm -hmm. I think Joe Biden is uh, good, uh, but he uh, seems kind of frail to me. He seems kind of uh, sort of not anchored the way I wish he were, you know, anchored, anchored. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Standing solid and firm. Right, sure. Uh, uh, we we have we have a question that we've been asking a lot of guests, just like um, regarding the uh, current situation with the virus, uh, and we've had an interesting mixed response: yes, no, from different people. And we're fascinated to hear your response to this question. Um, if um, you have to take a vaccine, would you take it for the coronavirus? For the coronavirus? Um, if it became mandatory, what would you do then? If it became mandatory? There's a possibility, there's some uh, suggestions that it might in some news outlets. Well, you know, listen, I, I believe in science, you know. Okay, I, sure, I, of course. I, uh, I believe in cl climate change and, uh, right. uh, so, so I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a scientific guy and I, I, think we should depend on our scientists we should we should demand proofs you know we should and they should do the proper testing um i know they've got a lot of a number of companies outside trying to to uh, create a uh, vaccine mm -hmm. um the problem could be that you know it's got to be handled better than uh than that uh, chloroquill stuff that Trump was right. saying, or better than you know injecting bleach into our veins, yeah. yes, or yeah. whatever he was uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. idiotically suggesting. You know the problem is <coughs> how did this guy even get into that office? You know this is a this is a clown. This is a clown. As somebody said early in the campaign, you know, uh, or, uh, elect a clown, expect a circus. Wow. wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. that's what we got, you know, yeah. but it's much more 
dangerous than a clown. He's much more. Uh, okay. So anyway, it's official. You are not retired from acting, so you'll be back in 2021. It's good to know the rumors aren't true. Yeah, I'm going to let Kieran O'Reilly know. I'm going to let Neil Pepe know. Who else are we going to? Uh, yeah, uh, everybody. Oscar Eustace, if you're out there. Yes, indeed. You know. And uh, we want to see more of your plays as well. Yeah. We haven't seen any of your plays. We want to see your plays live. On I wrote a play. I didn't like it. Authority on, at no, the I, I, no, I mean like the plays oh, that the Peter play has written. written. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wrote a play. I wrote a play about Abu Ghraib prison. About who? Oh, oh, about Abu. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, it's called Abu Ghraib uh, Triptych, <laughs> and it's about three characters. Oh, uh -huh. here we go. George Bush. Yes. George W. Bush. Uh, a uh, a um, young woman, yes. a soldier, private, with yeah. a naked man on a leash. Wow. Okay. And a prisoner of uh, in a cell, being held at Abu Ghraib, who has not seen his wife and children in five months. And who is starting to suffer a mental breakdown because of what he's being put through wow. by American forces. Wow. So I wrote this play, and uh, a lot of people just said they were so excited to see it. I called a number of very well known uh, off Broadway uh, producers. Yes. Who I knew personally. Oh, they were so excited. So excited to see it. Get it to us right away. Tomorrow? <laughs> <clears throat> and then, uh, then nothing. Nothing. So I'm still, uh, I think this is still a valid subject, you know. And I'm, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. And, uh, well, two of the plays have been published. I wrote it as three um, monologues. Uh, the best response that I got from anybody was from the uh, Royal Court Theatre in London who were interested, but the monologue form troubled them. And anyway, um, I've just finished um, rewriting that and making it not three monologues, but intersecting the three monologues so that um, it's more of a piece. It's not just three one acts. Yes. Two of which are published, by the way, in the best short plays, the best American short plays. I've had two of these monologues, two out of three published. Um, and so Oscar Eustace was one of the ones who experienced interest, but then he apparently lost interest, and I don't know why. But uh, so I'm still, I'm not, I'm not uninterested, certainly. You yeah. know, I'm not uninterested. Yeah. And, um, the problem with, with living here where I live now in the country is that um, it makes uh, it makes it kind of hard to do a play in New York as an actor. Sure. To, because uh, when I was doing this the, at the Atlantic, when I was doing this, the Simon Stevens play, uh, I would get home here at the train station at 1.30 in the morning. That's quite a trek, yeah. And yeah. that's going for the train right after the curtain calls over. Right. So I didn't get to go out for beers with my fellow actors, you know. <laughs> Which is why we do it in the first place. Right? Well, why the hell would you, yeah. except for the beer after the show, why would you do the damn play? Right. right. No, I love this play. It was a great play. But, um, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm questioning what my next, what the next step is, you know what yeah. I mean, and how I'm going to yeah. handle it. I'm going to handle it. Peter Maloney, it's been a pleasure talking with you these past three episodes. We've been honored. <laughs> honored. Yeah, it's an honor. Thank you for being so open and candid. And you, thank you for all your stories. Well, well good. I hope you're happy with what you got. And, very uh, happy. You're very happy. Thank you very uh, much. Very yeah. great. I, I, I've enjoyed doing it. And I'm telling you, the response from, and it looks good. I played the first episode of yeah. my, to watch it myself. And, uh, I'm telling you, response from from people who I send it to. You know, I forwarded it, forwarded the the link, and said, "Check this out." Um, they they really the, the response was very positive. That's nice. So I, I wish you guys well. 
with this project. I mean, what a thing you're doing. I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure the ramifications of it or how big it is or, or what. Well, in, it's, going, it's going to explode. Yeah. It's going to explode over time. Yeah, in about two years' time, we'll, we'll both be millionaires. And in about five years' time, we'll be multimillionaires. Correct. Yeah, well, that's good. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and of course, then there's nothing like getting to be a multimillionaire and, and then realizing you can finally afford to do theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like going to, you have to go to uh, Hollywood and be on a, a sitcom uh, on, on a, before you can come to Broadway and have your name above the, uh, above on the marquee, you know? Right, right on, yeah. I mean, I've said, I've looked at the marquees in, in, uh, on Broadway and said, I don't recognize one name up there. Who is that? Why are they famous? But they're famous, you know what I mean? Yep, yeah. yeah. And audiences will come and see them. Um, but so they'll come and see you guys too. Please, Absolutely. please God, but thank you so much and give, Give our best to Kristen. Yes, indeed. I will, and thank you very much very for helpful. having me. Yes. And I'm looking forward to hearing number two and number three. Absolutely. Coming yeah. soon. We'll let you know. Let you know. Great. When will, this, when will part two come out? Uh, so, uh, Saturday or Sunday. Saturday. What, this weekend? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. You're excited? It's okay with me. I mean, I just... Uh, I oh, think, well, I, uh, I think Saturday is July 4th, so we might wait till Sunday. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, you'll let me know, will you? We you will indeed. Yeah, yeah. Email you. Let me know it's, when it's up. You let me know, and I'll tune in right away. A hundred percent. Thank you, sir. And when I write, uh, when I when I forward these things, I, it says subject. You know. Yes. I say, too much Maloney! Exclamation <laughs> point. Question mark. No, that's not true. We could never have too much Maloney. We could have. Oh. We could have made it a five part, six part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, God help me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye bye.